Hello, you, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Tandy, All Things Tandy Radio Shack. Today, I have a real unique opportunity. I'm here with Paul Sh uh, Schreiber, and we're going to be discussing his life at Tandy Radio Shack. Hello, and welcome, and thank you for coming on board and speaking with us tonight. Thanks a lot for having me, and uh, look forward to uh, helping people out understand the difference between Tandy and Radio Shack. Oh, that's a good point. So let me start with uh, the beginning. When did you start at Tandy? So I started Tandy in January of 1977 as what we called a co-op. So a co-op is a student. I was an undergraduate electrical engineering at Texas A&M, and it was a school-sponsored program where you got one hour of college credit for every semester that you go, went to work at an engineering company. So it was a program run by the School of Engineering and we had what we call sponsor companies, everything from IBM to Hewlett Packard to Dow Chemical to put students in work environment to get experience. And we were paid minimum wage to do that. And so I signed up to do that in the what we call the spring semester of 77 back in the fall of 76 so i could work at nasa because nasa was a big sponsor of all engineers not just electrical hang on a second i have to scratch my eye sorry about that and my best friend had already been accepted at nasa so i thought it'd be cool if we worked together Turns out you had to have a secret clearance to work at NASA, and I didn't get my paperwork filed in time. So it wasn't that I wasn't qualified to work at NASA. I couldn't get my clearance. So I had to take the second company that was offered to me, which was Tandy. And so that's what I accepted. And I just showed up in January of 1977 to be a co-op at Tandy. I didn't even interview. I had no idea what I was going to be doing. I just literally showed up to the front door, which turned out not to be the nice fancy corporate offices of Tandy Radio Shack. It was next door in what used to be a tire company. So what was the difference of that? That's an important point. The difference between Tandy where you worked and the actual Radio Shack stories that we're familiar with. Right. So the corporation was always Tandy Corporation. There's no Radio Shack company. It's all a subdivision. So it's always been Tandy. There's never been a Radio Shack when I was there. It was always Tandy Corporation. Not only did we did Tandy own Radio Shack, they owned 17 other companies, including the tire company I was with, home improvement company called Color Tile, a nursery for trees and shrubs called Wolf Nursery, Tandy Leather, which most people are familiar with, all these companies. Radio Shack was just one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, they were the most famous and they were the biggest, but it, they were treated just like another part of Tandy. And at that time, Charles Tandy was still alive, correct? Yes, he was. He was so when you, were, when you first went to the, your, your first day, tell me that story and, and how that unfolded. Okay, so first day I was there, I walked into the corporate offices thinking I was going to work in this shiny building. It wasn't like the Tandy Towers. Now, this was like a four-story office building. It looked like a bunch of lawyers and CPAs worked in it. And I was told, you don't work here. You work over there. So I went outside and looked, and I saw a tire company. And I went back in and said, that's a tire company. They go, no, they're inside the tire company. We just haven't taken the, sound, the, the sign down yet. So I walked in the front door. There's a bunch of people. Turned out they were like accounting and sales and advertising. And they said, oh, engineering, it's back in the very back. And so engineering was back where the tire, well, well the car lifts used to be. They had taken the car lifts out. And we were in the back by the loading dock. Mm. And that was just one room with about six engineers around the outside wall and four lab benches in the middle with some parts drawers. 
And that was the entirety of Tandy research and development. Wow, so that's where it all started. In 1977. Now, the stuff that they worked on there had nothing to do with the TRS-80 Model 1. In fact, the people in that room didn't even know there was a TSR-80 Model 1. What they worked on there was some of the consumer stuff that you could buy in Radio Shack that was all DIY things. Mm. Forgive me, I want to get a drink of water. He knows why, but we're not going to tell. <laughs> As we like to say at Tandy Technical Support, there was a loose nut found behind the keyboard. <laughs> but anyway, so what they were doing at this division for research and development was we were developing projects that you could DIY by buying parts or boards at Radio Shack and buy all the parts at Radio Shack and walk out with a hundred dollar ticket. That was the whole idea. The hundred dollar ticket. It was mythical. It was magical. It was what they lived for, the hundred dollar ticket. Mm. And so what we did, you may have remembered the red and clear, they called them P boxes. It was a little plastic mm -hmm. kit, perf board with parts in a bag. And you can make things like an AM radio and things that would blink lights and stuff. None of, none of them were fully assembled. They were just kits. No, they were all kits. And then we sold blank circuit boards that may have one tricky part on it, but there were no parts on it. And it had a little piece of paper and you would tear off the back of the board and hand it to the store manager. And he would gladly go pull all your parts for you and give you your bag of parts with hundred dollars worth of parts in it. Now that didn't last long because you were involved in, in um, an early machine. You showed it to me. Can you show that for everybody now? The Oh, right. So I started doing this project, the project boxes, the red boxes. And I did a couple of them because we had so many people complain about them that the instructions weren't clear, but they didn't work very well. And I know this is a shock, but they didn't use the best parts they could find. We called them floor sweepings. And so I did that for probably four weeks. And then I was assigned to another engineer uh, named Jerry Heap, H-E-E-P. I apologize for all my stuff coming on here. Yeah, that's fun. Um, and We've he's been through just, enough already. And he's told me, I have the perfect job for you. I want you to help me on this cool project that's in prototype stage, but it's about to go to production and it's really cool. I'm gonna go get it, so bear with me. It's the Radio Shack TV scoreboard, okay? So it's a Pong game, you hook to your TV set and you can play Pong. Well, the trouble with the original Pong is that the controller that moved the paddle they were standard rotary knob controllers. That's mm -hmm. how the original palm was. So you turn, a lot of noise. The knob, you turn the knob left and right to make the paddle go up and down, All right? So that confused people. Like, I want something to go up and down to make the paddle up and down. So my brilliant contribution was, let's put it this way. So that's the paddle up and that's the paddle down. So as you move the paddle up, and down on the controller, the paddle on the screen went up and down. So if you went all the way this way, it was at the top. You put it in the middle, it's in the middle. If you put it at the bottom, it's at the bottom. Probably didn't it's, know it then, but everybody started copying you later because that's pretty much how everything was later on. Right. But it's my idea, and I'm a billionaire because of it. A <laughs> billionaire, I tell you. <laughs> well, so... What was the engineering? I mean, it's one thing to have an idea. It has to make it work. Well, the problem is, is that the little chip inside of here, okay, it was designed for a rotary pot. And so it assumed that when you turn that rotary pot all the way to the left, the paddle was at the bottom. You turn the, to the knob all the way to the right, the paddle was at the top. Well, a standard pot, for those of you who don't know, and I'm shocked if you don't know this, it's 300 degrees of, rota of angular rotation on a standard pot. It wasn't yeah. on my early electronics tests. Well, you took a bad class then. But <laughs> looky here, 
Does that go 300 degrees? No, it does not. It doesn't go 300 degrees. It goes 114 degrees. So if you just do this and you hook it up to the chip, the paddle is in the middle of the screen like this. It's not going all the way up. That's a stupid idea. How do you that such a stupid idea, Paul? Now it's not even going to work. Well, I had to make it work. So I changed three resistor values before it got to the chip. And I fooled the chip in there to make it think it's going all the way to the end. Oh, interesting. And that's called engineering. <laughs> well, I did that engineering. And that was my first official engineering job of my whole life for a real company was to make the paddle go up and down on the screen. So at that time, there was probably a big division between what I used to think was one whole organization, Radio Shack, and where you worked for, which was the Tandy division. I, I, I literally only, I never talked to a single person who was at Radio Shack that first time I was at Tandy. Not one time that a person from Radio Shack ever come into our building at all. We were just people over there. If we wanted to show Radio Shack something, we had to pick up this TV game and walk it over to them, okay? They were the customer. The customer sits there and goes, if you want me to buy it, then you better show it to me. And so we did, okay? So I didn't have any interaction with Radio Shack at all. I only had interaction with Radio Shack customers who would buy these things and write us letters. They weren't letters of praise, by the way. You can imagine what kind of letters they write. And so we had to answer the letters, but we didn't deal with Radio Shack at all. To me, at that time, I didn't even think of Radio Shack. Never crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. I knew that it was going to be sold in a Radio Shack store, but that wasn't important to me. What was important to me was to get the paddles done right. Okay, I didn't think about the marketing of it. That came much later when there was more at stake in the computer side. So you were on the ground floor of a lot of things. Like you told me earlier, we were talking a little bit about the way you etched boards in the bathroom. Right. So, yeah. So, right. So to make prototype boards, you had to, you know, etch them yourself. And we people used to call it, I'm etching the boards in the sink. Well, we used the women's bathroom sink, but we have what's called a Kepro etcher, a professional etcher but it was still not OSHA approved. We flushed the etch it down the toilet. Yeah, what happened to the chemicals after you were done with them? Right down the toilet. There was no <laughs> hood or anything. I didn't have any PPE equipment. I ruined all my clothes. It, the ferric chloride, the etch it makes everything bright orange yellow. My fingernails would fall off. It was exciting times wow. for everybody. Wow, so you, what were some of your worst reactions to that? Well, the, the, the developer to, to do their photo resist, I was, was allergic to, and I puffed up and turned red, and they thought I was going to die. They didn't call an ambulance, but I, they came close to it. Back so then, was, they hardly ever called ambulances for people who were sick. Uh, it's like, as long as you're still breathing, you're going to be fine. So <laughs> at least I didn't have to do that job anymore. So just about the time that happened, in comes this new guy, randomly unannounced. He's sitting in the corner kind of scruffy looking, scraggly hair, you know, we used to call it, you know, bad mustache, like, like Tom Selleck on Magnum PI kind of a thing. It was Steve Lonegar. Mm. And he had this thing over there that was a computer. And it didn't look like much. And so we weren't really interested. It didn't, the fact that there was a computer over there, we were just like, whatever. Okay. We're more interested in this clock radio. All right. We got clock radios. So forgive me, we have to edit this yeah, out. Those were big <laughs> items back then. The, the digital clock radios? Oh yeah, it was a big yeah. deal. That was, a, no, that was a big deal, I remember them. Yeah, I mean, we're talking 19, 1977. So anything with an LED display, people thought was like one step below Star Trek. Okay, yeah, there was Star Trek and there was digital high. clocks, okay? Right. Because the old, old digital clocks were little cards that would flip. Remember those little flipper things? like flip Analogs. Flip. Right, but this is digital. And they used to sit there when you're a kid and go, come on, turn to a three, <laughs> turn to a three. 
<laughs> and Avenue's so I wasn't the only one who did that. No, no, it was just me and you, nobody else. Just <laughs> right. So Steve Lager came and he wanted someone to wire wrap up. Wire wrap is a technique for wiring things together, the keyboard for the computer. And so they gave me a raw keyboard and a bunch of wire and a soldering iron and said, wire this keyboard up. So 68 keys, two contacts per key. So there's about 150 connections I had to wire up and I wired them all up correctly. It took me about 10 days to wire it up. So I wired that little keyboard up. He walked over there and he tapped on it and he basically went, okay. And that's that was my involvement at that time with the Model 1, all right? Interesting. It, it was not, we were still doing the board layout. We were still designing the plastics. Wow, so you were definitely on the ground floor of the Model 1. You know, Steve Loniger was still trying to get basic running. He had, he had the, once I gave him the keyboard, he could actually type on it. Hmm. But he was kind of off in the corner by himself. And we were kind of told, leave him alone, don't bother him. All right. But we were very busy. Most, most, most engineers at Tandy had four or five projects running in parallel mm. all at the same time. So there was no time for ooh and ah and ooh, show me your computer, Steve. We're just like, I've got to get this clock radio done by Thursday. Okay. So once I finished that keyboard, my time was up because I was only there for a semester. So I worked from January to the middle of May, then I went back to school. So for about three weeks before I went back to school, I worked on a circuit board project that was a circuit board with a chip already soldered on it. You would buy this board and take it to Radio Shack store manager who would put a hundred bucks of parts in a bag and give it to you. And then your mom would pay for it and ground you later. And it was for a stereo reverb for like guitars and stuff like that. It was a, an effects. And uh, it got some traction and it's pretty famous. It's used on some records but it's called the Radio Shack Electronic Reverb, for those of you who are in the music business. They were still selling when I was there. You know, and they, then they took the board, it used to be just a board, then they actually put it in a case with little slide pots on it. Right, that's what I remember. Right, but it's my original design. Interesting. That I did. So then I went back to school. So I just promptly was there one day and gone the next, and I didn't give Radio Shack another thought Okay, until I had to go back in the fall. So I went in the spring semester, I went back to summer, summer school, the summer session. And then I came back to Radio Shack in, on September the 1st of 1977 in the fall, as again, as a co-op. So it, at that time, when you came back, what was the, the, biggest thing that was being built at, at that particular moment when you came back to, to Tandy? All right, so when I came back, I fully expected to go back into the tire store and do exciting things, you know, like a little battery charger. And one of the things we used to work on was if you're a store manager, the five cell flashlight. It's mm -hmm. not four, it's not six, it's five. The battery's coming too. Don't so drop it. it. And don't <laughs> drop it, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff. But no, they said, no, no, we, we're not there anymore. We're not in the tire store. We're over at this other address by the railroad tracks. That's across the street from a cafeteria. And I'm like, okay. So I just show up and it's a factory. And I walk in and they're setting up this factory floor. There's a hundred people screwing around, setting up all this equipment. And I'm like, what's going on? They go, well, this is where we're going to build the Model 1. This is the Model 1 factory, and we have a perfect job for you. And I go, what's that? We're, you're going to go into the mail room and stuff requests for catalogs. And I'm like, I am so glad I just took that calculus class. Now, prior to that, you weren't, there was no mail catalogs. This was the ground floor for that, right? Right. They didn't have separate computer catalogs, all right? So what, what happens in Radio Shack? is that the catalog is mailed worldwide on September the 1st. But in order 
for your product to be in the catalog, it has to be to the printer on June the 15th because it takes them that long to print the catalog and put the catalog into the 12 distribution centers, then mail the catalog. Well, Radio Shack and Tandy were still arguing whether it should even be in the catalog. So there was still work to be done. There was parts to be bought, right? We, we're, we're trying to write a manual for it. David Lean and was like you said, typing pages the manual. cost money. Right, and every page in the catalog cost Radio Shack $5,000. Wow. And so what they did was a compromise. They said, we're not going to give you a page in the catalog because what happens if you put a page in the catalog on the front, there has to be a what? Stuff on, on the back, back. Stuff on the back. Right? And they didn't have any stuff on the back. So that's another problem. So what they decided to do was to put what they called a bingo card. These little things you tear out, fill out for more information, and you mail it in. And usually it's postage paid and you just throw it in the mail. This Tandy Radio Shack, so you had to pay, put a stamp on it. Well, most people decided, nah, I'll just put an envelope and put a stamp on it. So my job for a while, until the factory was gonna get running and I was gonna be a repair technician, and just quote, help the factory people, was to get the bingo card in and, and give it to uh, the little secretary admin who would type the label and I would put the label in a manila envelope and put a one-page Radio Shack flyer in there that actually had prices and stuff on it. And then I would give it to the mail guy. And they told me I would do this for about two weeks. But in their own words, don't expect much to come in because they didn't think this would be a big hit. They had no idea. And so I got there, I got... 10 little plastic tubs with zero to nine out of them, the first digit of the zip code. So I could count like so many came from California and so many came from Florida and all that kind of stuff. It was like I'm counting ballots. But the first day after the weekend, Labor Day, I got nine letters. And the first one I pulled out was from the Arkansas Casket Company. I said, that's cool. Dead that's people, when you want to save. Dead people want computers too. So I cut <laughs> the little logo out and I stuck it in my bulletin board. And the second one was from the Rockwell Corporation on the B-1 bomber program. Oh, that wow, was cool. Wow. So I cut that one out. And that's third cool. one was from some guy in Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah, I couldn't read his writing. So I threw it in the trash can. You missed out. So <laughs> I spent maybe an hour and a half sorting that out, typing the things, putting in envelopes. And then after that, I just kind of wandered around the factory till four o'clock and went home. Came back the second day. And this time I had about 50 of them. I'm like, ooh, 50. I can milk this for the whole day. And I did. So that was pretty cool, 50. And people were like, that's pretty good, 50, 50. Third day, guy comes in. He doesn't have any envelopes. I go, what's going on? He goes, I'm outside. So I go outside and on the loading dock, there's a little like 10 foot bobtail truck. And he opens the back door and there's nine sacks of mail and each sack has 500 envelopes in it. And these bingo cards were all just to find out more information about right. them all at once. Right, that was it. Wow. And so I looked at it and I looked at my boss and said, I ain't doing that. And so what they happened, weren't even ready for release yet. They weren't uh, at the store. They were, at this time, they were, they were, I can't remember exactly because I wasn't paying attention, but I don't think they were at the stores quite yet. Now, someone may correct me, but what I remember, the line was just that first week of September getting going, okay? Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but that's how I remember it. So someone out there, show me your show me the Radio Shack receipt that you have framed on the wall that says you bought it in August and prove me wrong. Because I know it was announced, I think, on August the 3rd of 77. So who knows? All I know is my, I didn't know until I moved from the mailroom to the tech floor that I could physically see units going out the door. 
So I guess by that time you had to get somebody else to try to do these bingo cards for you. Oh yeah, we just contracted Pitney Bowes, the people that make the postage meters, and they had a whole setup to do that. So they put me and all, all the engineers who were in the tire store, they pulled all the pro projects from them. So they weren't doing any, any more design projects. They were bench repair techs. And they would wheel in a Winn-Dixie shopping cart, which is a local store like Kroger or Albertsons, a Winn-Dixie shopping cart with 50 boards that failed the production test. And we had to, each one of us, there were four plus me, so we're five people, 250 bad boards a day. And we couldn't go home till we fixed all 50. Who was, was running kind of this big. operation at the, I mean, inside the warehouse, the manager? It was Kenji Nishikawa. So he was a QA manager from Japan. Mm. They had flown over. By the way, he's a world-class watercolor artist, still alive. He's probably, really? the, he's probably about really? 90 years old. And he's a world-class watercolor painter. At any rate, he ran the factory, but we didn't see much of him because he was very busy trying to get the boards out the door. It's all about the numbers. You know, you get, you know, he had a goal probably of, I'll just make this up. We wanted you to ship 300 a day. And if he shipped 290, you get yelled at. And if he gets yelled at, he goes, yells at somebody else. He goes, yells at somebody else. And everybody's all tense because you're not making your numbers. Okay. So it seemed to me like there was a lot of uncertainties. I mean, was it kind of rough working for Radio Shack or Tandy Corporation at that time? It was kind of more of like a sweatshop. Mm. You couldn't really... It was so fast paced and we were only focused on one job. And it was the same job every day. It never changed was these boards have to be fixed so we can send them out. Now, at first it's a challenge. You're kind of like, no board is gonna get past me. I'm gonna fix these 50 boards before lunch. Wahaha, wahaha. No Radio Shack board can defeat my knowledge. And after a while, you're going to hell with this one. <laughs> okay, you know, keep going. In fact, we had, a, we had a special pile of boards we called the dog pile. Hard and, ones. And that was the ones that no one could figure out. And kind of, kind of funny, Kenji in his, because English was the second language to him, he thought we were saying, dog bone and so he called them the dog bones mm. and we would he would say too many boards in the dog bone because you know, <laughs> they were piling up so they finally called steve Leiniger in and made him sit and try to fix the boards <laughs> we figured if steve Leiniger couldn't fix it we called them haunted and we had four or five boards that at this day no human being on the planet could ever figure out why they didn't work one of them would only work if you put your thumb on the data bus a certain way, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. but, we, the, but once the orders from the stores started coming in, they didn't focus on that. The numbers kept going up. They kept trying to get more out every day, correct? Because despite all of their, we don't know if it's gonna be success. We don't know if we'll ever sell 5,000. We don't know this. We don't know that. I think they had a demand that was probably about 50 times more than they ever dreamed. Mm. And that's a very, people say, well, that's the best problem in the world to have. No, it's, not. <laughs> no, it's the worst problem in the world. For one thing, you don't have the money to buy the equipment and hire the people to meet the demand. You didn't really have an assembly line per se at that point. No, we had a full blown assembly line cost $3 million. Really? Yeah, but we needed a $20 million assembly line. <laughs> oh, wow. So it was that big? Yeah. So it kind of got to the point where they couldn't physically put enough people and equipment in the space that they had to meet the demand. So, what was the, the amount of time between when you first walked in at that? tire store to what you're talking about now how much time passed 10 months really so less than a year they went from a tire store to these other buildings yes 
Wow. Right? Which was a big feat, which just goes to show you, okay, and when, and when, so there's a phrase about called a cut and jump. So a cut and a jump is a way to fix a, a mistake on a circuit board where you take an X-Acto knife and you physically cut the copper trace. And then you take a special kind of very thin wire that's usually blue in color, what people call it a blue wire. It's got Teflon, Teflon's blue for those yeah, of you. We, actually, we had to do those a few times on some boards. And, then you, really and then you solder on the back of the board on the, on the pins from the part sticking up, and that's the jump. So you have a cut and a jump. I remember doing that on the 2000 for something. So oh, far yeah. back. Yeah. So it was not uncommon for the first production run to have cuts and jumps, some more than others. Okay. Model one had zero. Really? Steve Loniger, who did the design, and Larry Atwell, who did the board layout and the mechanical design. They did it right, and that board shipped with no cuts and jumps, none, which was kind of unheard of for that kind of technology. I mean, companies like Digital Equipment and IBM had cuts and jumps on their boards, but not, not Tandy. We had we never cut and jump on our board. That's not true later, but it's true on the Model 1. So then you left for a little while. You went back to well, school. I, I went back to school. So my time was up. I was so sick of bore repair. I never wanted to see a Model 1 ever again in my whole life. Okay. And I didn't plan to ever see a Model 1 again. Hey, Paul, you know, you we think you're a great guy because you were part of that Model 1 now. So it all comes back. Right. Full Carmen. circle. Carmen. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, and also as an aside, when I was at the factory doing the repair, I rented a room from Steve Leininger and his wife. So I was Steve Leininger's tenant in their house. Wow. So that was interesting. So I went back to school. I graduated in May of 1979. I got a job at Data General. To build what was your graduate, your degree? What you graduate as? A engineering? BS, electrical engineering. Bachelor yeah. of Science, electrical engineering. At the class of 66, I was number 33. How in the middle could you possibly be? Okay. <laughs> Bear with me just a second. I'm going to get a drink. Hang on. Yeah, quite all right. Quite all right. Okay. It was a good place to be. So when I graduated, I went to Data General. I was designing uh, graphics terminals for many computers. We were part of a book called The Soul of a New Machine, which if you haven't read The Soul of a New Machine by Tracy Kidder, won the Pulitzer Prize. You need to get that book. I'm not in it. The people I work for are in it. I was just a peon, okay? And so I loved that job. I would still be at that job, except one year, almost to the day I was there, they sold our building to the state of Texas for a new research center. And they gave us 30 day eviction notice and I was gonna be out of a job in 30 days. And I literally didn't know what to do. I, I kind of panicked, okay? I was, this was totally, you know, a lot of times if people who've been laid off, you always get a hint like, oh, things were bad last quarter and hey, Fred's gone. What happened to Fred? This was like complete lightning bolt out of the blue. Everybody gone. Everybody gone. We don't have a building. Bye bye. Where are you going to go? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And so I did the only thing I could think of. Picked up the phone and I called my old boss, Chris Klein at Tandy. And I said, uh, hey, Chris, this is Paul. And he goes, they fire you already? That's, that's, that was his way of saying, hello, how are you doing? Did they fire you already? And I said, no, Chris, but we all got laid off. And he, I said, do you have anything I could do? He goes, I got something you can do all right. I said, how much are you making? And I said, I'm going to get myself a little pay raise here. And I said, I'm making $19,200 a year. He goes, no, you're not. I'm going to pay you eighteen five. Well, the reality was um, I was actually making about, hang on, I got some kind of weird Zoom thing. 
the reality was I was making 18,600. So I accepted his job with a hundred dollar a year pay cut. Ugh. And I went back up to Fort Worth, but this time we were in the Tandy Towers. So how long of a, were you with that company? That Data just, General. Data General. How long were you there between the time you left and then you, their towers are there? How much time trans, transpired? One year and three days. Wow. So there was huge growth then. Well, I was there. Well, no, that's not true. True. It was, it was one and a half years. I was gone from Tandy for one and a half years. Still a short amount of time to one go from years. those. Right. And so when I came back, the Tandy Towers were brand new. I mean, they were, you could smell the paint. They were, they were brand new. So we, we, from when you first walked into the tire store to the Tandy Towers, how much time are we talking about? So that was from May of 77, I mean, sorry, that was January of 77 to June of 80. Wow. So, so there's January, massive growth. Three and a half years. Massive growth. Three and a half years. So now three and a half years have passed since I first walked in the door. Three and a half years. All the people are still there. Not, oh. one, not one person had left. They're all there. A few extra ones, but all the original people. Since the first day, every single one was still there. Was your Japanese manager still around? He was running a factory far, far away. Mm. So he was still an employee. Mm. Okay. So I had a desk with an engineer named Jerry Heap. We shared a cube. And I knew Jerry from back in my old days. So we got along. And Chris, who was the manager, came in. So I got to work at about 8.15, and he came in and immediately told me I was late. We started at 8 o'clock. Way to go, showing up late on your first day of job, Paul. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. He goes, what am I going to be doing? He goes, you're going to design a modem. And I said, no problem. And he walked away. And I turned to Jerry Heap, and I said, what the hell is a modem? <laughs> was this for the Model 1? This is... Just a modem. Yeah, it wasn't even really a okay. sign. So, so you have a computer. To, so it was actually for the Model One and and the color computer. Oh, the Coco. Yeah. Okay. And it was so, out there, huh? yeah, the Coco was out. Okay. And so the the one, the one. Right. Right. So so I had to figure out what a modem was, and I and they gave me a budget. And the way things work at Radio Shack, such so Radio Shack was our customer for this device. This we bought by our Radio Shack. They sent so Radio Shack would give us a PO. There's a PO. They wanted thirty thousand of them, and my cost, you know, what I had to sell it to them for, was something like twenty two dollars. And so it was. It wasn't twenty two dollars and one cent. It was 22.00000. Oh, 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 oh. oh, wow. Period. No wiggle room. No wiggle room. So there was a big division now at this point between Tandy Corporation, Tandy Division, what you're doing, and Radio Shack, completely separate right. entities. Different buildings there were in Tower One, were in Tower Two. Tandy by this time had other customers besides Radio Shack. We had Blau Punk and Alpine. In, in Kenwood car stereos, okay? So we designed car stereos. We we're designing answer machines for Panasonic. So we didn't have 100% of our business from Radio Shack. We had about 80 to 85% of our business from Radio Shack. But not, but not all the business from Radio Shack. So, and we were trying to get more non-Radio Shack business all the time. So were you building speakers for uh, companies outside of Radio Shack at that time? Right. Too? So, so Tandy had a speaker factory in the Fort Worth Stockyards, Yeehaw. And that's where Steve Loniger started before he moved over to the tower company. I don't know if that was an upgrade or not, go from the speaker factory to a tire store. <laughs> it's kind of smelly over there. But yeah, we made all the speakers for 
for Ford hey, cars. Radio Shack made some great speakers. I would have professional customers come in from all over to get Radio Shack. That right there is right. a Radio Shack speaker. Right. So yeah, the Opt-10, Optimus 10 that Chris yeah, Klein yeah. designed and stuff like that. The, the people know us for the Mach 1 that had that big 15-inch woofer in the, in the horn. Always wanted a set of those. Right. We actually had, you know, uh, a full, so we had an engineer and a technician who did nothing but speaker designs. And the engineer also went to AM. His name was Richard Makus. And they had an anechoic chamber where you put the speaker in a, and then you spin the speaker around and make the measurements on and stuff like that. So, so we a lot had, of work went behind designing one of those. Yeah, a lot of people made fun of Radio Shack in general, but very few people made fun of Tandy. Okay. We had some of the best engineers working there who could do multiple things. A lot of people in their whole career as engineers, they're really good at one thing. I'm an expert in fiber optic connector optimization for multi-mode fiber going down the loop. <laughs> you go, yeah, but can you replace the battery in my watch? No. <laughs> But ask me a question about multi-mode fiber connectors. I'm the world's foremost expert. Well, the engineers at Tandy, it was very typical to do five projects in parallel. And for example, Jerry Heat, my cue mate, one day he would do, remember the universal remote controls that mm -hmm. could learn? Okay, he invented, he invented the whole concept of a learning remote control. Really? His idea. Interesting. And he would do that. And then he would work on an answer machine and then he'd work on a voltmeter all in the same week. Wow. Okay. And so, and that was true for everybody. And it was go, 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 go. I so right around then you had the Model 1 coming out, you had the Coco coming out. What Model 1 was out, Coco was out, Model 3 was run, going out, what Model was, 2 but, Model two was out. So what were they tasking for you at that point? What was your next big so, project? So after, so after I did, the modems, it was time for Shark Tank. And so if you know the show Shark Tank on TV, oh, yeah. Mark Very Cuban, familiar. right? People come in and sell your project. It's a pitch. Yeah. You pitch and they decide thumbs up. Thumbs up. So, so Tandy and Radio Shack had their own internal version of Shark Tank that happened twice a year at the hotel. We had the, the Worthington Hotel fancy hotel right next door to the Tandy Center in a conference room. And it was Bernie Appel, president of Radio Shack, and Bob McClure, president of Tandy, across from a conference room table with a court reporter taking transcriptions. Mm, wow. Of everything they said. And Tandy would pitch to Radio Shack ideas of what to do. And so how do we know what to pitch? Because Radio Shack before would give us a list of things they were they they thought they needed and then they went to the engineers and we could add to that things that we thought they needed whether they whether they knew it or not we thought it would be a good idea all right and so all the engineers were supposed to turn in five ideas but i was new so they only made me turn in one and i was thinking what would be a cool idea i know the Model 2 needs a high-resolution graphics card in it because it's our professional computer sold by professionals to professionals by professionals for professional application. And so let's make a graphics card. Now, it's going to be black and white. So you weren't even talking about color then? Oh, no, no, no. Model 2 was never in color. Mm -hmm. All right. It's black and white, but, but it had enough pixels on the monitor to do, you know, 640 by 400 monochrome, black mm. and white. And I said, that's enough resolution to do some pretty good stuff. I think we should have it. So I wrote it up and I wrote like a little spec, like, you know, a number of pixels and about, and of course you had to kind of guess, you had to tell Radio Shack how much it would cost them. We didn't tell Radio Shack what to sell it for. We told them what they would have to buy it. Radio Shack bought with purchase orders equipment from Tandy. And we build Radio Shack and Radio Shack paid Tandy for the stuff we shipped them. Now you can argue, 
Well, Paul, it's all the same bank account. What the hell? Is the money going from here? Well, if you're married and have a wife, you know about separate bank accounts and money going across. And that's exactly what we did. We had separate bank accounts and money was going across. And it, and it wasn't the same money. It's different money. Okay. And so I send it in. And sure enough, Bernie and Pell thought it was a good idea. And so they came back and they said, all right, Paul, it's approved. And I said, so? They go, well, start building it. I'm like, well, you know, at this point, like, you, had no, you had no prior history in graphic card building. No. Look like go, in the back with uh, that other company, General. Uh, Data General? Data General. You I was doing working the power supplies. Oh, okay. And the power supplies. And so. So no history background in no, graphic no. cards. I just knew you could do it. All right. And so my, my belief was that the computer group. So I was in the non-computer design group. So we had the computer design group, which is run by a guy named Mike Berger and two people, Mike Berger and Sam Sawyer. They only did computer stuff. And then we had people that was run by Chris Klein, my boss. So Chris and a guy and Jerry Heap, another engineer named Pete Hagen. We did non-computer stuff little weather radio, the weather cube radios. Yeah. That was one of ours. If you bought a voltmeter, that was one of ours. If you bought an answer machine, that was one of ours. Okay. I still have one. You know, the remote control, universal remote control was a big deal. That was, that was Jerry Heaps. Okay. So the computer people stayed down there. Now, occasionally they would ask us for help. And so we'd wander over and help them out, but would always wander back. They never came this away. And sometimes went that way. So I assumed that they would do this graphics card. But the rule was, if you proposed it, you had to do it. <laughs> and so they gave me this thing to do, this graphics card design. And I said, oh, boy. So it took me a while, but I figured it out. And I got three patents on it. So I'm pretty proud of the fact that something I've never done before. I, mean, I got patents on the modems. Because I kind of figured that out, but the graphics card, I figured it out and it went went there. And so I was an employee at Tandy officially, not a co-op, okay, from June of 1980 till September of 1984. So this was before Hercules then. The Hercules graphics card came out about 86, 85, 86. Okay. So you were already looking at the high resolution graphics and of graphics card way before anybody else was. Yes, I was. <laughs> and, I, and here's a little here's a little fun fact. So if you watched any NASA launches where they showed Houston Mission Control from about 1983 about 1990 okay and you see the picture and they're all sitting in front of a console right you really can't tell what's on the console but they're all you know what i'm talking all these people in a big room that's a model two you're looking really? at that's a model two in nasa control center and each one of those model twos has one of our graphics cards in it yes indeed you duty so they went up to space wow well, Not they didn't too many people space. can say they that. In, no, they weren't in space. They were in mission control on the oh, ground. They weren't in the capsule. No, I said, okay, start over. Mission control in Houston, Texas. Part. The big room. But all no, these, I know what you're talking about now. The big map on the front. All those computers. All those computers. Everyone was a model one. It was a model two with the graphics card. Really? Yes. I wonder if that was a connection from when you told me that that bomber group initially got one of those uh, bingo yeah. cards. Could have been. It could and they have never been. forgot. They never forgot. They go, hmm. <laughs> I remember that guy. That guy. Yeah, that guy <laughs> did that, and now we'll buy his graphics card. Interesting. You know, then they ripped them out and put like Sun 10 workstations or something realistic in there, okay? But so at this time, okay. we're, we're, you're really moving. I mean, Radio Shack is, and Tandy Corporation is, is and Tandy itself. They're, they're just going, they're going nuts. I would say 
the, 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 what people call, when I was there, we called it peak Tandy was 83 to 84. And I think 1984 was the first time we crossed a billion dollars in revenue. Was that the peak? Wasn't it after that with the 1000s came out? Like the- oh, I'm signing for me. Okay, listen, oh. I said again. The time that I was at Radio Shack, the entire time I was at Radio Shack, what I call peak Radio Shack, which means the most projects, the most people, the most scrambling, the most attention was right. 83 to 84. Right. Now, I left in the fall of 84 over pay. Mm. Radio Shack was a great place to work, but they just did not pay. And in 1984, I, was, I, I got married. So and was I, that before married, the, the 2000 came out? I think that the 2000 came out in 85. No, the yeah, I can't remember because I, I did the 2000 graphics card, but I can't remember if I did it when I came back or not. 85, 86, I, I don't think. remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember. I did the model. Okay, I have to understand. I did 43 projects at Tandy. 43. So this is the I'm third not, time you've left and come back. Now, when you came back this, this time, third, what were you working at? Well, this is the third time. So I left in the fall of 84. And I go, I went to work for a telecommunications company for four years. And I didn't come back until the fall of 88. That's when I came back. So from the fall Another of four 80, years past. From the fall of 84, the fall of 88, I had no contact with anybody at Tandy. None. No you got married. Me. I got married. I had a child. Things were going great. Life went on. Life went on. I was still in Fort Worth. Without I still, Tandy. I was still, my, my wife had quit. So my wife was a technical writer at, at Tandy. She wrote. Oh, really? So, Did you meet her there? Yes, I met her in a stairwell and I followed her. She was right. going up the stairwell. I was coming down the stairwell. I said, hey, now. And I followed <laughs> her and I saw where she sat and I wrote, because we all had little name plates on our right, 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 right. I, remember I wrote right. her name down and then I looked her up in the directory oh wow and then I got the girl that sat next to her to ask her out to lunch with a group <laughs> of people and she was a tech writer so remember the quick reference cards that kind of yes. folded up yes so every computer had a quick reference card she did all those quick reference cards oh really our computer model one model two model four what whatever stair, what stairwell was that Say again? What stairwell was that that you actually met her in? The south stairwell of Tandy 2, because she worked on the 13th floor and I worked on the... On you the know, what's floor. funny about that when, the, when I told you, we talked earlier, I won two, one, I run, I went and um, won a trip to uh, Hawaii, first place mm -hmm. in California, total sales. The second time I came in second place and won a trip to Fort Worth, you know, it was a little bit of a decline. Uh, right. But I walked down that very stairwell. I know that stairwell because I went all through the towers and walked through every stairwell. I met a lot of the, the security staff. I even got one of their badges. One of the guys I, got, he was so, I was so mad or a um, matter of everything. And he goes, here, take this as a souvenir. I still have that. Badge. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I walked down there very stairwell. I know exactly the, the stairwell you're talking about. The reason we used the stairwell is because the elevators were extremely slow. Yeah. It would take like five minutes to get an elevator. And so we were all in our 20s. We were slim and fit and we had a hair. And we were just run up and down the stairwell. I just, okay. I just remember that the guy that was showing me everything, the tour person, whatever he was called, he was a security guard. He never used the elevators, always used no. the stairs. Always used the stairs. Yeah, always used the stairs. And so I was, I came back in the fall of 88. Again, because the company I was working for was sold. This is a very common theme with me. What company were, were you working for? It was called Reliance Electric, and it was being sold to a British company called Marconi. And they didn't take you with them? I didn't want to stay because all the senior engineers bailed. 
and there was I would they would have come in and go, who are you again? <laughs> okay. So come on, did, Paul, you didn't know how good you were. So you'll never guess what I did again. What did <laughs> I do again? Was it the same guy? I picked up the phone and I called Chris Klein. And he goes, how many times do I have to hire you after you've been fired? And I said, I promise it's the last time you ever have to hire me again. So they actually, by that time, enough time had passed where they understood they couldn't pay engineers $25,000 a year to work there. Um, so they actually matched my salary. I was making it Reliance Electric. I didn't get a raise, but they matched my salary. That's not, not a so loss. I went right back. But by then, they were building the Tandy Technology Center. Mm. So I went back to Tower 2, but only for about seven months. And then we had to pack everything up and move across the street to the famous Tandy Technology Center. And that's where I stayed until 1994. And then I left in 1994 when AST bought Tandy. Well, let's not talk too much about that just yet because I want to use that for another episode because that is an exciting second chapter. But when you came back in, because we got a few more minutes, when you came back, what was the first project you started to work on this last time you came back when you moved to the Tandy Technology Center? I don't have it handy. Um, if anybody, so you can see that test equipment back there. Yeah. All right. There's a, hang on. I love Husky tools, by the way. You see the Husky right. tool box there? Very nice. I've got a story about Husky uh, tools. So, so this is a digital voltmeter. I bought it off of Amazon for $28. Okay. It's my daily driver, I basically use it to fix my pinball games, mm. right? And when you measure AC voltage, not a battery, but AC voltage, mm -hmm. like out of the wall. Right, alternating current, yeah. Right? Alternating current, even though it's voltage. You want something called true RMS, which RMS means root mean squared. And that means it'll give you a value, even if it's not a perfect sine wave. So if you want to measure the, the value of something that's like a square wave, you want to measure it true RMS. That's an industry standard that everybody understands. So if they all have a meter and you measure the same signal, you get the same answer. Okay, that's what it means, true RMS. Well, you have to do a mathematical calculation to do true RMS. And when I came back, I, again, I came back right when we we're about to do a shark tank. Mm. And Radio Shack did not have any meters that were true RMS. Oh. And when I was working in a telecom company, I did telephone equipment, central office telephone equipment, not for your home, for the central office. All of our meters were true RMS from a company called Fluke. Hmm. Hang on a second. Sorry, F L U K E, Fluke. Fluke meter. And I said, we, we do, Radio Shack needs to have like a Fluke meter. Well, a fluke meter is for 350 bucks, okay? And I said, I'm gonna make a true RMS meter and we're gonna sell it for $99. And that's what I pitched, okay? So Radio Shack had a little desktop. So we call this a handheld meter that you're supposed to hold in your hand as opposed to a bench meter that sits on your bench and you just leave it there. So I want to do a bench meter, $99, true RMS. I had no idea how to do it. But <laughs> Another I, one of those ideas they bought. But I knew, but see, but now I knew that if they bought it, I would get to do it. So, so you weren't shocked. No, we pit, I know I wanted it. I wanted to do the meter. Mm. I did not want to do the graphics card. But I wanted to do the meter. And so they approved it and they gave me the project. And I spent a whole year working on that meter. And it, it came out and it was the world's first true RMS voltmeter 
for a hundred dollars. Wow. Now they all have it. I mean, this this one, this $27 one from Amazon has it. But wow. nobody in the literally in the whole world had a true RMS meter. And the magazines thought Radio Shack was like faking it. And so they would make measurements against they would put my meter and the $350 fluke meter next to each other and they get the same answer. Interesting. They were like, how is this possible? It's it's Radio Shack. Come on, it's Radio Shack. And they go, well, listen, it, Radio Shack sold it. This is important. Radio Shack may have sold it, but freaking Tandy designed it. Yes. And that's, I think, I, I think right there is where we probably should cut for, for today because I, I, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, Paul. And I want to leave this to about an hour. And we're about through now. We've got, I'm really excited for this next part because you're talking, you're going to be talking about the probably the world's greatest computer at the time, the Tandy Sensation. I'm just going to leave that as a teaser. That's not, uh, here's a teaser. Here's part of, here's part of my development board for a Tandy Sensation. Wow. Oh, I would like to have that board, matter of fact. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, so it about 10 hundred other people. Well, okay, let's just so say that I've already there's a story about we'll talk about how I got that board, and I've already sold a bunch of boards, and a lot of people out there who listen to this podcast are like, I've got one of those, and I got it from Paul, and you don't, because that's the whole point of collecting. The point yeah. of collecting is I have it and you don't. You know, I just recently, as long as I've been looking for it, I just recently got a Tandy Sensation. I got it from a gentleman by a name of Mark. Cow I, I'm not going to do his last name justice. Crowder. He was a salesman for uh, Radio Shack, Mark I think. Crowd Crowder. Yes. He bought stuff from Tandy, from you guys, I guess. You would design I, something and then he would buy it. He was the one who, who bought the Sensation. Right. So we, we, they were called buyers. I know that's probably. Probably not the right term, but. Right, but buyer. So Radio Shack at any one time probably had 35 individual people who are responsible for a line, which is the first two digits of the part number. So if you know Radio Shack numbers, oh yeah, I buy the 11s and the 12s and the 18s. Oh, wow. So, you know, and my guy said. I don't really? care about any of those others. He bought the sensation. That's right. why he. And He's, I bought uh, more in my in, mind. In, in the computer group. There was so much going on. They had four or five people. Wasn't that four one? I think those serial numbers started with four. Oh, one. I don't. You're. I mean, so long ago. See, because well, because engineers, we don't we don't like numbers. We like <laughs> we like names. Okay. So, <laughs> so hang on. So the name for this card was Wendy. Wow. This was the awesome. Wendy. So we called it, and part of the reason we called it Wendy. Just put that in an envelope and send it to me. Was that, <laughs> here's the back of it, it's got a little actual part. Right. The reason we called it was we didn't want the vendors who we talked to, the people who would, we would ask to give us samples of the chips, we didn't want them to know what we were doing. Mm. Okay, we didn't say, oh, yeah, this is for a new, computer called the sensation it's going to be you know, great no we said this is the windy project and it's we said funny. compact uses that tech that uh same theory a lot with their designs but with that i'm going to leave us here we are at pretty much close to an hour i want to thank you paul for your time with us and this is going to be interesting i want you to stay tuned guys for part two because we're going to get into some of the really gravy of uh, what i think radio shack really pushed if I don't see 55 or more likes on this video, you're not going to hear about the VIS or the Simpsons. <laughs> there you go. So All right. Better, better click okay. that like button. All right. I'll Thank you, you very much, Paul, for taking the time. We will talk to you soon again in part two. Stay tuned, guys. And uh, thanks again for everybody for watching. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.